So good evening and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to ask everyone who is not going to speak to please mute your microphone so that we can better hear our host. And I will be putting on the chat Cindy Sherwin's email address so you can send your questions directly to her, which she'll then pass on to Mitch. Um, I would like to present Anne-Marie Boucher, which is also part of a Montreal chapter, our national board and international board. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Cindy, for hosting that, for agreeing to host, a, a host this Zoom event tonight. And without further ado, and Marie, is that the volume? No. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, two hosts tonight. One of them um, I know quite well, my husband, uh, Mitch. <laughs> um, Mitch is a lawyer uh, by profession, but really an entrepreneur at heart. Um, early on in his career, just left his law practice to um, become, uh, sorry, to become uh, um, a CEO of uh, several public and uh, private companies, very British, which you, have you, to, uh, you have to put everyone on mute. Um, yeah. Jan, just uh, everyone should go on mute. Great. And so Mitch has basically uh, spent his entire career at the helm of uh, several public and uh, private companies. And currently he is the chair of Cirque du Soleil as well as uh, Invest in Canada, which is the uh, uh, governmental agency uh, in charge of bringing investments uh, in Canada. And as you know, in a pandemic, the pandemic that we're currently experiencing, um, the economy has been uh, quite uh, um, turned upside down and some companies have been affected more than others, um, Cirque du Soleil being one, which uh, makes Mitch uh, a very um, current person to talk about what's next in the post-pandemic uh, economy, which is the topic uh, tonight. Um, Mitch and I are, are also uh, philanthropists and have been in, involved in philanthropy for several years. And I'll divert for a minute um, to talk about Weitzman uh, because of course Weitzman is uh, one of the um, organization with uh, which we are involved, myself uh, being on the board uh, of the Weitzman Institute. And really it started uh, more than a decade ago as a, I would say in French, a coup de coeur um, when we lived in Israel with uh, our family and uh, before getting involved, we wanted to uh, get a little bit uh, more information and, and, and uh, started asking our Israeli friends what they thought about uh, the Weizmann Institute. And of course, all of them um, had raving comments, but I remember one that was quite interesting and basically said the Weizmann Institute is Israel's best asset. And there's really nothing more relevant in a pandemic than uh, a top rated leading science institute to really help us get out of this mess really that we're in um, and, and is affecting the entire world. Um, and now, of course, uh, on to Cindy Sherwin, um, who also doesn't need much introduction. She's uh, our uh, journalist. She's a journalist, a reporter with the uh, CTV News for uh, the past 23 years, and has covered a wide range of, uh, of very important stories. And one of them I remember was the story of the Air Canada flight that uh, was tasked to go to Haiti. Uh, after the earthquake more than a de decade ago to bring some very um, uh, needed uh, material supplies, but more importantly, to bring back a very important cargo of 24 orphans, which had been adopted by Canadian families, um, as well as the very tragic uh, story of the train derailment in Lac Mégantic back in uh, 2013. Thanks to the inspiration of her two scientist parents, Cindy dove into medical reporting and won 
the Radio Television Digital News Association Award um, for her report on drowsy driving, which is a bit of a tongue twister for me here, and the John Alexander Award from the MS Society for her report, Multiple Choices. So I'm leaving you in very capable hands tonight to discuss what's next in the post-pandemic economy. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I'm also a very big fan. Uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of the Weizmann Institute. I visited many times with Anne-Marie and Susan and uh, have brought other guests of ours who we bring to Israel to visit the Weizmann. And um, it is an intriguing and impressive place. It's a place that we brag about. And, um, you know, Susan continues to do a great job uh, bringing Canadians to, to Weizmann and bringing Weizmann to Canadians. And I appreciate her asking me to join tonight. And I've done a few of these. And I really, like I said to Susan before, I, I really enjoy doing it. Um, I think the Zoom platform is a great one. Um, it allows you to, instead of having 20, 30, 40 people over for a cocktail, you know, you get, you know, twice or three times that many people uh, who have 45 minutes to spare and who are basically stuck at home. So um, in a way, I'm the beneficiary of, of people being stuck at home. So look, the pandemic is, um, the pandemic, pandemic is many things. It's, it's creating so much havoc in the world that the first and foremost um, problem, of course, is a health-related problem. And the health-related problem is causing um, the loss of many lives and many elderly lives. And here in Quebec, we've lost more elderly lives than we should have lost or than anyone should have lost. And um, it's pointed out to us I think uh, that we have missed on the way we treat our elderly and maybe even our, our poor well elderly who depend on the government to, uh, to support them uh, in their older age. So that's obviously you know, the, the most important piece of this is, the, is to make sure that we stem the loss of life and that's where science comes in as well. But when you shut down the world economy, the economic impact is unpredictable. If it was 1929, 1930, we would say, we're gonna have a global depression we're probably not going to have a global depression because in 1929 and 30, we didn't have the ability to implement sophisticated stimulus and probably didn't have the willingness to indebt our future generations the way we do today. So the way the US today can uh, print $9 trillion of stimulus dollars, uh, basically what that means is it's passing on $9 trillion of future debt. Now, whatever $9 trillion was in 1929 or 30, um, that wasn't a methodology for dealing with the depression at the time. And I think that in 20 years from now, um, someone like me <clears throat> will be giving a speech about what is the economic impact in 2040 of the $9 trillion of debt that was entered into in, uh, in 2020. So when someone says, well, you know, we'll talk about the future uh, of the economy post pandemic, the real, the real truth is that nobody knows. And if you watch CNBC and you read the Wall Street Journal and you read the Financial Times, you can listen to a number of economists who have deferring views about V-shaped recoveries and U-shaped recoveries and W-shaped recoveries. Um, but most of those economists on television are talking about the stock market and the stock market is not the economy. The stock market is a reflection of how people are betting the future value of co public company stocks are going to be. And the reason I say that is because usually when we don't have a pandemic, the stock market's a great indicator of how the economy is going. People are buying things. Uh, people are traveling to places. People are spending money. Um, and that's a reflection that's reflected in the prices of stocks on the stock market. When you have a situation like you have today, um, it's very, very difficult to look at the stock market as any type of indicator. Uh, the only thing I can say that it indicates is that people are willing to bet on the future value of stocks rather than invest their money at 0% interest rates. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a willingness almost to gamble. So if you're a, a hedge fund or a mutual fund, you need to show returns to your investors, so you must invest in the stock market because bonds aren't paying anything. Uh, if you're an RRSP holder and you're hoping to live off of the interest of the money you saved all your life in your RRSP, then you're also going to be getting zero interest in your fixed income investments. Maybe you'll get 2% if you, you know, if you buy the right bonds. And then if you take real risk, you're buying high risk bonds to get 6% or 7%. So you may also be taking a gamble on buying stocks in the stock market. What I think is important for people to think about is the real economy. And many of us on the, on, on the Zoom are actually not really in touch with the real economy. The real economy is the unemployed who will not be reemployed. So the true unemployment rate, I believe that the true unemployment rate 
is going to be much higher than predicted because the predictions and the projections are that all the people who are currently unemployed have been laid off temporarily until the end of the pandemic. That can't be true because many, many companies are going bankrupt, which means their jobs won't exist when the pandemic is over. So the restaurant will be closed and the hairdresser will be closed and the mall will be half empty. So it, or the airline will fly half its routes for a year, a year and a half, or the hotel will only have half of its rooms occupied, or the restaurant will only be able to serve half the number of people because they have to do social distancing and leave every second or third table open. So it's just not credible that the people who are currently unemployed will be reemployed. There's also not been an accurate projection of the true bankruptcy rate. So one of the things that skewed the bankruptcy projections is that the courts in Canada and the United States have essentially been closed other than for real emergencies. So there's a backlog of bankruptcy protection applications that will be coming forward in the next several months. And then there's also a backlog of people who don't know they're bankrupt. So you own a small Italian restaurant and you haven't paid rent in three months. The government will pay one month rent. Um, maybe the landlord will pay one month rent and maybe you can afford to pay one month rent, but that may not be enough because you may still in three months from now have very little business. And those next three months are not being picked up by the landlord or by the government. So I think this, the idea um, of what's the real economy going to be is not reflected in Boeing or Air Canada because those airlines will survive. They need to survive because they employ hundreds of thousands of people, um, but they're not reflective of small business and small business represents almost 60% of the economy. So I'm quite concerned about the real unemployment rate, the real small business bankruptcy rate, the real credit card indebtedness of real people who have, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you have not been spending money on their credit cards at the level that they would if the economy was moving forward, but who still have credit card debt, but no income. So their credit card debt, that they've had for the last six, eight, 12 months that they've been making partial payments on um, is going to be piling up on them because the interest rate charged by credit card companies, in my view, has always been offensively usurious and is a terrible tax on middle and lower middle class people. And especially when they're out of work and out of money, 22% uh, interest on your credit card bill is absolutely unaffordable. Um, and then you have, uh, one more situation, which is the situation of people paying rent. So either their apartment rent or their uh, commercial rent. And there, when, the, when the pandemic started, there was this view that, oh, well, you know, let the big wealthy landlords absorb the, the non-payment of rent. Well, no landlord is able to absorb many months of unpaid rent. I think most landlords are going to be as fair as they can be, but they're also looking to stay uh, above water. And it's very difficult to project today what's, what is the future of retail shopping over the next 18 months? Uh, what is the future of in-mall underground, especially here in Quebec and Ontario, where we have the largest number of underground stores of anywhere in the world, um, which is quite problematic if you have uh, government guidelines that make shopping underground um, almost a non-starter. Now, I think that that's changing today, tomorrow, and in the weeks to come, but you still don't see the large uh, flows of people um, shopping, uh, the whole idea of how you're gonna try on clothing and then put it back, how you're gonna buy clothing and then bring it back. Um, the number of people that have actually been now um, newcomers to online buying and who realize that that's actually quite a good way to shop uh, if you're worried about getting COVID, um, et cetera. I'm gonna uh, turn over to Cindy so that Cindy and I could have uh, a conversation but I, I do want to take the opportunity, and I'll do it with Cindy. I want to talk about the businesses that I'm directly involved in, because I'm really, like Anne-Marie said, I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing uh, the Cirque du Soleil, which generated about $2 billion of revenue a year, a um, billion to Cirque du Soleil, and then another billion to its partners, MGM and, and, and other. And today, um, today, since March 5th, it has been a zero revenue company. Um, so from 2 billion to zero and from 5,000 employees to, to 200 employees, so laying off 47 or 4,800 employees. Um, so I'm seeing something that was never seen before because there is no way to prepare yourself to have zero revenue. And people will say, well, you know, they had too much debt and too much leverage. That's only very partially true. 
um, we had more than three times more money to pay our debt each year. So we could afford for business to, we, we could afford to lose half our business. We can't afford to lose all of the business. I'm involved in another business called Rackspace, which is a cloud computing company, which is filing for an IPO soon because it's having the best year that it's ever had. And so it's really kind of feast or famine. Um, if, you're a, if you're a retail mall builder, like Andrew Lutfi here in, in, in Montreal, building a huge multi-billion dollar development, uh, there hasn't been a crane moving and there hasn't been anything happening for, for several months. So um, yeah, I want to talk about the sort of the real, the real world situation that I'm, I'm able to, to witness and participate in uh, every day. But I want to open up to Cindy and I want to say something about Cindy. Cindy's been a friend of mine for a long time and we are very lucky to have her in, um, in Montreal. She's one of the people who stayed in Montreal um, and who's made a great career. Um, it's a very hard industry. The English language journalistic industry or occupation in Quebec is the most difficult to keep a job in of any, I would say any business you can be in in, uh, in Montreal. And many of Cindy's friends and many of my friends um, who have tremendous talent have unfortunately found themselves uh, unemployed um, either because um, you know CTV has cut programming, CBC has cut programming, uh, the Gazette has cut, has cut content. And Cindy's been uh, an awesome uh, mainstay. So when uh, Susan said, oh, what do you think of Cindy Sherwin? And Cindy Sherwin, I love, to talk to Cindy and uh, she has a lot more to offer than just to ask me questions. She's got um, real opinions and, and real experience. So um, let me see if I can see her on my screen. I'm in bright okay. orange. Yeah, I know, I know. Me. <laughs> it's a good TV color. Hi, Cindy. Hi, thank you for your kind words. Um, I did want to sort of start off exactly where you did. Uh, interestingly, just today, the new governor of the Bank of Canada just echoed your words and said, fasten your seat belts, we're in for a bumpy ride. And he thinks there will be, you know, long-term economic damage. And so we can't skirt around it really. And as you say, it's the average person uh, who's gonna be most affected. And I was thinking about the words we're using in the media now, which is, you know, unprecedented. And, and um, you know, we're using it ad nauseum but never has it been more appropriate. It's not hyperbole, it's not sensational. And what you've been through, and Marie mentioned uh, Sirkin, you brought it up, it, I'm, I'm sure is, it's unprecedented, of course. There's no other way to describe it. It's been staggering, it's sobering. Um, and so it's nice to have you here in a way to get, the, uh, to see what it's like from your end of the table in that role, because you do have to think about lives and people thousands of employees. I heard the owner of one company, you know, say that this has been a real exercise in extreme crisis management. And I don't know if that's abated yet, but I'm wondering um, what that view was like. Uh, was it this exercise in crisis management at the outset? You know, there's no playbook for this, really. Yeah, well, I think it's, um, it's interesting to talk about it during a call that has a connection to philanthropy because there really there really is um, a division between the haves and the have-nots and Henry and I uh, are extremely conscious of the unequal and unfair distribution of wealth we don't apologize for capitalism uh, we don't apologize for having made money we pay all our taxes we give to charity but that doesn't make it fair um, nobody has yet thought of a better system than the social capitalist system that we live in, in Canada and Quebec, where we make sure that everyone has, you know, the basic access to social services, uh, and you can be encouraged to be an entrepreneur and build. Uh, it's also the only, probably the only place in the world where private individuals donate money to government owned hospitals. That doesn't happen any, anywhere else. So it underlines this whole haves and, and has nots. And um, so it's very hard because it's one of the first times in, I'm not, you know, I'm not 80 years old, but I'm, I'm 55. So I've seen a lot. It's one of the first times that this, it is the first time that this many people have been laid off when they were doing a great job, when their company was performing extremely well. So Air Canada was having the best year ever. Um, Expedia was having the best year ever. Cirque was having a really good year. It wasn't the best year ever, but it was having a really good year. Um, maybe restaurant Beach A on Sherbrooke was having the best year ever. So all of these places have laid off all of their, almost all of their workers. And so it's very hard to watch really good people who've done a really good job working for a really good company uh, from one day to the next be 
out of work. Now, I do think that the government uh, has stepped up in a meaningful way, but it's not enough to, to make up for the loss of salary and benefits um, that our employees have, have had to suffer. So I'm sitting here and I know, you know that, that, that Henry and I, I, everyone on this phone is in the 1%. We're all in the 1%. It doesn't matter what part of the 1% we're in. We're in the 1%. We all live in a decent home and eat three times a day and our kids go, probably go to private school and you know, go on vacation a couple times a year. So um, you know, I think you have to have empathy. I think you need to understand you know, where, where other people, uh, what other people's experience is. It's very different to live confinement um, in your home where all the kids have their own bedroom. And then think of two people in, 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 in Verdun who have four children in a two bedroom and both parents are out of work and you can't go back to school and there's no babysitting. That's been the reality for a lot of people for four months. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, which is why we give money, whether it's to Sontrade or to Weitzman, it's all about, it's, you know, it's all about trying to give back. Now, this is a particular emergency, you know, so Weitzman comes in because research becomes important and Sontrade comes in because helping poor people in Montreal becomes important. Um, so I found it, um, obviously difficult, but at the same time, it, it allows you to take stock of your situation and, um, and be extremely appreciative uh, of it. And so let me follow up on that because, um, you know, with Weitzman, um, they've, they've had to pivot and have pivoted beautifully in one regard to, to look at how they can merge the economy and health so that everybody can move forward. Um, and that takes flexibility and agility. Um, so, so that dovetails with, in a way, what individuals can do, what, what you can do. Is that, is that the future in your view, being adaptable, being agile, turning things upside down now, looking at everything differently? Yeah, in, in business, it's absolutely imperative. Um, I always use the example of Amazon. It started selling books and CDs. Um, and today it sells some books and obviously no CDs. Uh, it's become the biggest cloud hosting company in the world. It's become the biggest retailer in the world. Um, and it wasn't doing any of those things um, when, it was, when it was created. It pivoted into what people needed and it used the, the skills and the assets that it had to, uh, to do that. I think people are going to have to be very much the same. I'm not, you know, I don't know more than, 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 than most people about what's the future of work, what's the future of working spaces, what's the future of uh, remote working. Um, you know, I do know that our children will be better prepared by understanding AI and, um, and, and internet and cloud computing and being somewhat tech savvy. You know, if, I mean, if I was having a young child, if I was having a baby today, um, and then the baby grew up, you know, over the next 20 years, and then as an 18 year old said, what do you think I should do? I would probably rather say, you know, if they weren't gonna be going to medicine, I'd probably rather than be an engineer um, and study computer engineering than to become a lawyer like Anne-Marie and, and I. Um, now we have a son who's going to law school in, in September and I think that's, that's great and I'm, I'm very proud of him. But in 20 years from now, um, maybe, maybe we, would, we might think differently um, than we do now. So do you think, um, I don't know if this applies to your organizations, um, do, do, uh, do businesses, organizations as well have to um, move in different directions? In other words, collaboration, it seems. It's, we've learned with the virus, with uh, vaccines, with mm -hmm. uh, moving forward with all this health that will health um, research, the scientific research that will allow us all eventually to really get back on track. Um, you know, you're a competitive guy, mm -hmm. obviously, um, and that's in your nature, uh, along with the empathy. But how do we, how are we going to, how's business going to balance that? We are going to have to be more collaborative. Well, um, collaborative, yes. Yeah. So let me, let me talk a minute about sort of some of my failures because it's, it's, it's easy to talk about success. So um, if I think about Cirque du Soleil, I mean, I'm the chairman, I'm not the CEO, but it doesn't matter. I mean, as a, as, a, as a group, we did not figure out how to make real money online, streaming content, creating television, creating film, 
Um, I can give you all the reasons and excuses, but the reality is it remains a live human entertainment company. Um, and it doesn't make money streaming its content around the world. Now we sell 15 million tickets a year, but there's 7 billion people in the world. That means almost everyone in the world does not see a Cirque du Soleil show. And we haven't figured out how to charge a subscription for people in India to watch the Cirque du Soleil and want to pay to watch the Cirque du Soleil uh, on a YouTube channel. Um, I'm on the board and an investor of L'Envin, the French fashion house. Um, and you know our online sales need to be greater uh, than they are. Um, very good friend of mine is on the board of Revlon. Revlon does 8% of their 3 billion of sales online. So imagine, I mean, in my view, and I'm not running Revlon, but that's a, that's a product you should be able to sell on the internet. But somehow in 2020, they're doing 92% of their sales in retail stores. Many of those retail stores are going bankrupt. Uh, so it could be JCPenney's, it could be Neiman Marcus, it could be, you know, whatever the, whatever the, 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 the chain is. Um, so yes, you need to be, I think you need to be really agile. And this pandemic has, I think pandemics can become a word in the English language that means something other than just um, a, a spreading disease. It's mm -hmm. going, people in business are going to have in their business plan, are we pandemic ready? Are we pandemic insured? And I don't mean real insurance because now that's going to be unaffordable, but you know, have, what happens in a pandemic? Because in the past, if I would have said, you know, at a board meeting, hey, what if we go to zero revenue? Everyone would say, well, why prepare to go to zero revenue? I'd say, but what if we're going to go to zero revenue for six months or nine or 12? Shouldn't we figure out a way to not have to go bankrupt? Now, the easiest way is, well, why don't we just keep a pile of money in the bank? I don't think that's the answer because I want to use that pile of money to buy other companies and businesses. I don't want to run my business scared of the next pandemic. But I do think there's going to be a whole new way of thinking in meetings about what are we going to do uh, in, um, in a pandemic situation. I'll tell you another business story people will be interested in. It's another, another bad story. Um, so Anne-Marie and I are investors in a, what's, what, was, what was going to be um, an ultra low cost Ryanair type airline in Canada. And so let me tell you this, the story of this. So we made the investment together with the founders of the airline. These founders of the airline have founded all of the great discount airlines in the world, sit on the board of Ryanair, found Spirit Airlines, et cetera. And six months after we make the investment, we're preparing the business to launch. We have you know, Transport Canada certificates, et cetera. And this airline is going to be using the 737 MAX as its, as its airplane. So the two 737 MAX tragedies and disasters happen. So of course, you're not launching an airline. There is no 737 MAX. It's offline for over a year now. Um, and maybe they'll come back, maybe it won't. And maybe people will want to fly it, maybe they won't. Then the pandemic comes. Now, no airlines are flying anywhere other than very, very local, local routes. And all airlines have laid off 80 to 90% of their people. So when is the airline industry coming back to where people will be flying, wanting to fly, sit next to other people, uh, et cetera? So there are certain things you just can't, you just can't uh, plan for. Um, and I think it's important that people like me talk about their challenges in business, um, you know, along with all the, all the successes. And I don't think it's possible to have a lot of great successes uh, without having the challenges. Now, this pandemic has certainly thrown way more challenges at us than, uh, than anything I've been exposed to in the past. Yeah, I was uh, interviewing a, a, an, an aesthetist uh, two weeks ago and a young guy at our Montreal General Hospital here. And um, you know, he was talking about the fact, talking about not being ready, about, you know, the lack of equipment, the things they didn't have here um, to treat patients with COVID. Um, he's young, optimistic, though, and said, you know, the flip side of that is that it did expose all the weaknesses, which is a part of the story you told before that, you know, it exposed all the frailties. And now he is uh, doing a research project and thinking of ways to innovate. And so, it strikes me as you say all that and explain some of the failures and, and some of the things you know, we can learn is that that is gonna be key. We're gonna need those thinkers in business, in science, in health, the economists. Um, and then there is that balance between the public sector, the private sector, government, and private individuals to, to innovate uh, in that way. I think so. I think um, also it's, it's amazing how many things are happening at the same time. So, you know, we're not gonna spend any of this time talking about Trump, but
but the Trump re-election campaign is a real world economic and right now world health event. What's happening in the United States as a result of Trump's re-election strategy is actually killing people and creating a real health problem. And we're all very dependent on the United States. So you could say, well, let's just fence them off, but they're very hard to fence off, right? And these are human lives we're talking about. And so, and, and the Black Lives Matter movement is real and it's causing havoc and the proper havoc. But if you look at the election strategy of, of Trump, uh, he needs for there to be confrontation. So none of these things are good for a smooth resolution of, of the pandemic. So you want the economy to come back. The most important economy to come back would be the American economy. Well, they've had 30,000 new cases in the last two days and we in Canada have had 700. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Trump says last night, well, we're testing more people. It's not true. They've tested 7% of their population. We've tested 7% of our population. We have 10 times, ten, one tenth of their population, but they have 30,000 new cases and we have 700 new cases. So we're doing a really good job, but Canada's economy does not stand on its own. So, you know, I, I saw a story while we were on, you know, that there's going to be that, you know, Trump may cancel a lot of uh, work visas and maybe some student visas that could affect Canadian students and Canadian workers in the state. So we're not, so we're talking about, you know, the, the pandemic, obviously, the reelection campaign of Trump, the Black Lives Matter and, and social unrest in the United States um, and, and the potential impact all of this is going to have. So, and that's going to be, uh, don't you think that's going to be an internal, also a domestic um, debate? Because just today, I think, or yesterday, um, dozens of business people called on Trudeau to open the borders sooner, right? I think it's July 21st. And yeah. uh, he said, no health trumps that, pardon the pun. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but there's going to be all those, all that pressure brought to bear. Uh, uh, wanting to move forward and wanting to move safely and not repeat those mistakes. Are, are, do you hear those conversations in the business world about how? Yeah, to sure. Move I mean, sure. Um, you know, Henry and I were with Kaylin Robinescu, the CEO of Air Canada, the other night, and he knows a lot more um, about COVID and air travel um, than than we do. And you know, I think Trudeau obviously has done a good job at flattening the curve. We can't say otherwise. Um, Quebec, if, you, if, if, if it weren't for Quebec, Canada would actually look much better. Um, our CHLSD record is as bad as the record of any place in the world, unfortunately. And I don't believe that's the fault of Francois Legault. I think he's done a, a good job. Um, what I tell people I like about Francois Legault is, is his ability to um, back off from a decision. And he's done it many times. So he wanted the economy back four, five, six weeks ago. He wanted schools to restart. Then he moved the date. Then he moved the schools to outside Montreal. Then he said the Montreal schools would open two weeks later. Then he stopped that decision. So I, I respect it a lot, but you know, I, I'm not close enough to the decision-making in, uh, in government. And obviously, Cindy, you're watching it, uh, watching it daily. But whatever they did in BC and whatever the rest of Canada have done and whatever Quebec has done, and I think I, think I know what they've done, I think they've given clear guidelines, and I think Canadians, by and large, are quite rational, obedient, reasonable people, by and large. So, by and large, uh, we don't yell at people outside Farm Reprieve to take their mask off. We don't push to get in before them. Uh, we don't, we just don't do it. And um, this is not to, to be anti-American, because I'm not anti-American. I, you know, I, I, I actually love America. I don't love what I'm seeing of America right now, but I love America. Um, but I think we're just, I think honestly, we're, we're handling it as a, as a people really, really well. I just want to also take a chance to make an opportunity to mention my email address, one of about four that I have <laughs> that you can all have, which is uh, sherwincindy at gmail.com. So if you do have any questions for Mitch, we definitely have a little bit of time left. So please send them in. I do have someone who wants to interview you, but you know, we got you first. So <laughs> another day. Um, yeah, the, the, I think, um, you know, and I think you, you talked about uh, about the debt and um, the spending and, and there was uh, uh, another announcement today, you know, talking about uh, that they can't let up on the stimulus programs yet. Um, and we do live in a different um, country where there is more of that financial support. Um, but yeah, in, in, you know, as you said here, the private sector does help out. 
Um, mm -hmm. And there will be a need for that kind of support in the future to, to move everything forward, don't you think? Yeah, we expect it from our government for sure. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what what companies are going to do um, when people are afraid to come back to work. So if I think about the Cirque du Soleil as an example, even if you said that the Cirque du Soleil is back on tomorrow, um, well, half our show, half our revenue comes from Vegas. Half our customers are probably around 60 years old, let's say. Many are older. So just, the, just because you could have the Cirque du Soleil back in Las Vegas doesn't mean that people are going to be piling into a enclosed theater and, and attending a, a 3,000 person event. Actually, I think they won't, to be perfectly honest with you. So, um, you know, we haven't talked about a vaccine, but it seems to me that nothing's going to change dramatically until there's a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, we may get some waves of calmness which I think we're getting now, we had 64 new cases in Quebec today. So probably none of us will know anyone who got COVID today because only 64 out of 8 million people got COVID today. That's a, that's a great thing. But that's due to the fact that we're all living quite carefully. And if we start saying, oh, there were zero cases today. So now, you know, Susan makes a dinner party with 40 people at her house and we're all not wearing masks. What's going to happen is that in six, eight weeks, there's going to be this huge new wave, which is what happened in Florida and what's happening in, in, uh, in other places. So it'll be interesting to see how employers um, handle their employees, and what is the what's going to be the what's going to be the state of affairs? You know, we have a bunch of uh, businesses that we all love, but will they survive? Um, how and how will they survive? And how many people? And, you know, Susan said she's going to go to a restaurant for the first time. Great, and I think, and Anne Marie said this is before we went on the air tonight that that we need to um, absolutely stimulate and support these restaurants. Buy gift certificates for friends. Do whatever you whatever you can do. So, I, think, I think you yeah. mentioned earlier about um, advice for young adults. I did get a question, yeah. if you wouldn't mind sort of chatting about that again briefly. Um, the person wants to know what advice you have for young adults who are trying to figure out their future careers because, you know, um, yeah, we, we, we don't know what, what the future will hold. Um, we know technology yeah. uh, is, is a huge factor. So. You know, I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a sort of a, an analogy. You know, if, if you said you wanted to be a baseball player, but you only wanted to play second base, you'd be narrowing your chances of being successful by about 95%. And I think that people who have a wide, if, if people who have a wide array of interests that they pursue, because um, what I'm seeing today is young people are teaching themselves. Yes, you go to school, you get a degree, that's great. But there's so much information that if you're interested in AI or uh, electric cars or um, w whatever it is that you're interested in, you're basically able to learn much more about the thing that interests you on your own than you're going to learn at Concordia or McGill or, or Harvard, right? So getting a degree, I'm always uh, a promoter of getting more than one degree. But I think that you need to expand your interests and become passionate about more than one thing. And you need to be, you know, you need to be for sure knowledgeable about the internet, for sure knowledgeable about social media, for sure knowledgeable about the future of AI and how it's going to impact businesses. Um, I think it's important to know what is, what what are the trends in in society? Where is society going? Um, and so it's not enough. You know, this is what I'm getting to. It's not when I finished McGill in industrial relations. It was enough to have a BA in industrial relations. You were like, wow, you got a BA from McGill, right? Then I, then I happened to go to law school and I was like, oh, wow, he's a lawyer. It, those two things were enough to make people make you feel successful. And today, I'm not saying that law degrees are a dime a dozen. They're not a dime a dozen, but it's not going to be enough to get out of law school and say, okay, I'm a lawyer. Now, where are the cases? No, you're going to have to be really much better than that. Um, and it's not enough to get a BA and say, okay, here's my BA, now employ me. Um, and and Anne-Marie and I talk about this a lot. The competition to get into university is 10X what it was when she and I went to university. The competition to get a job in any good company is 10X what it was then. Uh, everyone's got this super human LinkedIn profile. Uh, you know, Every kid's worked for 10 charitable organizations and everyone's had their own startup already by the age of 17. And uh, everyone speaks three languages and has traveled the world and can cook Indian food. 
it's competitive. Like I just, you know, I never even applied for a job probably in my life. So I didn't have to have any of these, any of these things going for me. Um, so I think it's important. I've interviewed many, many hundreds of, of young people and I'm always interested in, I'm interested in the person that's just a bit different. I call the others copy paste. I know you have, a, you had a good grade point average. You went to a good school. You took two years off. You worked in a bank and you went back to MBA school and that's your profile. It's an amazing profile. Now, are you great in an interview? Did you take time off and travel to India? Um, do you do yoga? Do you speak a second or third language? Do you like to cook? Um, so I'd like to know that someone has some diversity in their, in, their, in their profile. That's my biggest advice to parents, to my own kids, to anybody. Um, you're not, if you're gonna be a copy paste, then you gotta be lucky. Um, don't count on luck because it does happen to lots of people, myself particularly, but you can't count on it. You can only look back on it and say, wow, I got really lucky, but you can't say, don't worry, I'm gonna be very lucky. So I'll, I'll sit tight, everything will work out well for me. Be interesting is what you're saying. <laughs> interesting and interested. Interested, curious, exactly. Uh, speaking of which, I was thinking about, maybe I'll get a scoop out of you. <laughs> yeah. so when, when you talked about uh, Cirque du Soleil um, and you talked about the online stuff, that's really interesting, you know, because, um, you know, Smaller organizations like Just for Laughs, for example, you know, they've, they've gone in that direction over the years, the TV shows and um, like you, they have different festivals in different uh, cities around the world now. Um, so is that an avenue that knock on everything uh, that you might go or you can envision going? Yeah, we will go, we will go, but um, the technology is not ready for us. And we're, we're actually, at least we're realistic. Our content doesn't look amazing on your computer screen. It will look amazing with virtual reality glasses when you know, you're able to sit at home and watch Wimbledon with VR glasses and it seems like you're actually sitting in that seat at Wimbledon. And that's not far away, but it is far away from people in India being able to buy a pair of those glasses to watch the VR uh, produced Cirque du Soleil show. So I don't know, maybe I'm, I, I was involved with the Cirque 15 years too soon for uh, for technology. Um, I'll answer this one question here, uh, Cindy, I have it in front of me. Um, sure. What's gonna be the relevance of debt in the future versus the past vis-a-vis -vis living our lives and operating a business? Uh, I tried to kind of answer that earlier um, in terms of leverage. Um, Henry and I are not fans of personal leverage. I am a fan of corporate leverage, responsible corporate leverage. And um, unfortunately, like I said, I don't know that well, I do know that before March of 2020, nobody had in their leverage plan, zero revenue for, and in the case of Cirque du Soleil, it'll be close to zero for a year. Um, but I do think that companies will probably be one turn less levered for a few years because the aftershock of the pandemic will uh, be such that banks will lower their lending threshold increase their covenant threshold. And as far as um, individuals are concerned, I'd like to see the statistics. I don't know the statistics of Canadian consumer indebtedness and credit card debt. Um, like I, I should know more. Like I, I should know whether we're actually a credit card society. Like I, I don't know, I, I think the perception of the states is that they're a credit card society. Um, but I, I think it's very, it's very, very dangerous for us to allow uh, middle and lower class hard workers to get too indebted at too painful an interest rate. And I don't know why nothing's been done about the credit card interest rates. And I used to be in the credit card business, um, but issuer rates are, are it's absolutely not right. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm a big fan of the banks and the Canadian banks do a, a tremendous job. I don't necessarily think it's fair that uh, a person who makes $200 a week and needs to do a $30 withdrawal from a bank machine. And if it's not their bank's bank machine pays $4 for it. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair. Um, I think they could make a little bit less money and make it a little more fair um, or charge a lower fee for people with a lower balance. So I, I think we need to start getting more conscious of, of how we put people in debt and how we allow people to become in debt. Um, in, you know, in corporate uh, debt, everyone's a big boy and a big girl. So everyone knows what they're getting into. You know, if I borrow 900 million, someone lent me 900 million. If I put this asset up as collateral for that 900 million, they took that collateral for the 900 million. If I default on the loan, they take the assets and they sell the assets and they 
take what they take from it. That's not quite the same as 22% you know, interest rates on credit card debt. Hey, I, I'm gonna steal this phrase, but just before we went live with this uh, great chat, um, I saw an article and the headline was, and it just reminded me, um, you know, we're in a state of post-traumatic growth, we hope. It sort of seems to sum up a little bit of the feeling that we're all in. You know, there's there's this desire and need to to find optimism. You know, and there's so much great stuff going on. You know, we we also have to focus on that, which you have. You know, with the new jobs, the careers, and the, the new avenues, and uh, the research and innovation. But it's in a state of almost post-trauma that we're all walking through this together. Businesses, the average person, it seems to sort of sum up where we are. So you know what? I mean, I'll end on, on, on this note, and I hadn't thought about it until you just, you just mentioned it. Um, one of the oldest sayings in, um, you know, regarding money is, and your grandmother told you this, is to put money away for a rainy day. Right. When Anne-Marie and I got married, and we both were employed, we had a rule that we would put $1,500 a month away. And we kept doing it even after we had money, but we kept doing it. And that lesson should not be lost on our kids. And I'm sure that many of our kids don't have that mentality, but it's raining right now. It's pouring rain. And I could, I could accept that my, some of my companies don't have money for the rainy day because we made educated decisions, but it's not acceptable if you could have put away money and you just kept on blowing it on uh, nightclubs and bottle service and uh, Gucci shoes, and all of a sudden the rain starts to fall and there's no safety net there. So if I were you know, talking to a group of young people, I would be telling them, please don't be so arrogant as to think that it won't rain and you'll always be getting a big paycheck or a big commission check or, or whatever, because sometimes it rains for a long time and no money's coming. And if you have that thousand dollars a month put away for 80 months, that's $80,000. That's, that's a big umbrella, you know, in a, in a rainstorm. So, I mean, that's not brilliant advice because my grandmother gave it to me, but it <laughs> certainly it's, you know, and, 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 and Anne-Marie forced it upon me, but it certainly, it certainly applies today. And, uh, and we've lived by it, to be honest. Yeah. And all our habits have changed. A lot of people probably on this panel talk even about that, you know, we don't go to restaurants. We just haven't been allowed, but even the instinct has changed about what to do, what to buy. You know, people are re-examining their lives, right? Really, they're, right. They're, they're looking at how they live and what they spend money on and priorities and values. And so it, that's a, a, the positive aspect of the growth that we'll, we can all look at, at where we put that $80,000 you've saved and um, how, to, how to live our lives, uh, hopefully to, to go and, uh, you know, and, and, to be, and to better answer uh, the question, I hope that the banks are, I hope the banks figure out a way to help people who are buried under debt uh, to be able to, uh, to come out of it because bankrupting people is not a great solution either. So anyway, Cindy, it's really great to talk to you and I'm very appreciative of Susan for asking me to, uh, to do this. And I'm especially appreciative that people actually, um, you know, logged in and spent the time, uh, the time listening. So I hope you're not disappointed, but I really enjoyed it very much. And I certainly love seeing Cindy and Susan and my, being introduced by my wife. So it's a perfect evening. Thank you. Great. Over to you, Susan. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mitch, for making the time to be with us and for your insightful comments. Very thought provoking. And by the way, you created your own luck. And it's really important for people to know that, especially in this new reality. Really inspiring. Thank you, Cindy, for so eloquently, as always, moderating the discussion. For the past 15 years, I've had the privilege of working with amazing leaders and ambassadors like Anne-Marie and Mitch, representing the Weizmann Institute of Science, and never have I been more proud um, or more grateful. At, as this health crisis continues, we're reminded, as you heard earlier, that science is the only place to look for answers. Science gives us hope that this pandemic will end one day, and it will. I have no doubt about that. As a world leader in basic research, the curiosity-based multidisciplinary approach at Weizmann makes it uniquely positioned to make a major impact in solving the COVID-19 crisis. As you heard earlier, 
There are over 65 labs focused on various aspects, which can be divided into more or less three directions. Improving testing, including the widely acclaimed smell tracker, and we can send it all to you, it's very cool. Um, tracking methods and data management, including the 410 model to return to work, which appeared recently in the New York Times. And developing drugs and vaccines with many promising molecules and targets already being tested. In addition, a Center for Infectious Diseases is being established to ensure that we're better prepared for the future. Scientists worldwide, and particularly those at the Weizmann Institute, are finding creative ways to share information and data widely, so no critical insight is lost and all good ideas are considered. Competition to publish first is being put aside in the interest of ensuring that findings build upon each other towards a common goal. That is true open science. Each of you have the power to move the needle forward, so to speak, um, by investing in critical research at the Institute right now. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about supporting initiatives related to COVID-19, and I get it. You're experiencing what's now being called pandemic fatigue. There's been great media coverage actually about this recently by Cindy's colleagues at CTV Affiliates. At the same time, I hope that today's event gives you all hope. Approximately one third of you have already generously supported this important campaign and we are so grateful, thank you. For those of you who are just learning about this critical initiative today, I invite you to visit raisedays.com COVID-19. You'll see it in the chat box below. Uh, to learn more and invest in pandemic solutions from the comfort of your home. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please consider making a gift in honor of Mitch. <laughs> and thanks to the Weizmann Institute, uh, gifts now are generously being matched up to $50,000. So your donation will have double the impact. Our goal is to get us to a million dollars this week and we're almost there. Um, just to, to let you know, for up-to-date information about ongoing research, please follow us on your favorite social media channels. And thank you all once again for making the time to join us. Thank you to my team for making this happen. And I look forward to our continuous conversations. Most importantly, stay well. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Thanks.